Thanks, Mark. Um, thank you very much for the intro. So my name is Simon Corbett and uh, I'm the Chief Information Officer at Northumbria University. And um, I did actually think I'll, I'll tell you a story today. Um, like, like all good stories, it, it, it's got a bit of drama. And I guess like all good stories, there's a bit of learning and a bit of thinking that sits underneath the story. And, and, I, and I hope that proves useful to people as, as I talk you through it and, uh, and what happens. I, I thought I'd begin, though, with a bit of um, a bit of background and a, and, and a bit about to, 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 to place all of this. And, and, I, and I like this slide. I don't like the slide because the graphics are pretty good and I don't like the slide because the numbers because I'm probably think you know it's like one of these slides where 98% of all statistics are made up on the spot right but but I like the impact of it and I think this grounds where all this comes from and, and I think it's quite pertinent actually with the recent news I'm sure you've all seen in the BBC over the last couple of days about uh, about what's happening um, with, 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 uh, with, the, with the file transfer system using a lot of payroll stuff but but cybercrime is absolutely huge you know and, and you know whether this is true or not, it's sitting there third in world economies by the amount it costs, not the amount that's necessary cyber gangs get, but the amount it costs institutions. You know, it's forecast to be $10.5 trillion by 2025. It's more profitable than the gun trade. It's more profitable than the drug trade. And, and, and suddenly you start thinking, you know, I, I, I get this and I, and I get why this, this, this anchors back to things. So I like this slide and I think it's a good introduction of, of, of what's happened and, and people kind of realise then why it's important. I think it's also useful to think about actually what, what happens in real life. And, and so I thought I'd give a little bit of background of what actually happens in, in a cyber attack. And then we'll anchor that back when I want to talk about what, what, what happened to Northumbria. So it's normally a four stage process that these gangs go through. And step one is normally a bit of intrusion, right? So you know, we hear about phishing, but there's other ways, and we'll come on to some of the other ways that people get through. But, but the first thing is getting through the front door. And this is actually incredibly easy. I'm lucky because I'm at a university and I've got a really good cyber cyber um, team. So they've been onto the dark web for me. And you can easily find for a few thousand dollars lists of usernames and passwords of various organizations. And that's because there are gangs today that are set up called access as a service and they'll sit there on the dark web and they'll go and find out and they'll just go and exploit basically how to get through the front door and so it's really readily available if you're into that kind of thing you can go onto the dark web pay a few thousand dollars and you can get lists of usernames and passwords uh, it's incredibly easy incredibly cheap and these access as a service gangs make their money from just selling volumes and volumes of it so step one is normally intrusion and it's normally you know a, a, a user person who's given access to that front door and someone's exploited the vulnerabilities of institution and they've got to step in the door what then kind of happens is actually the the organization will work out what's going on and they'll steal some data and they do this without you knowing so they do this quite early doors and they'll steal some sensitive data try and get as much as possible they tend to do it over a bit of time actually so you don't see a large chunk of data suddenly leaving the door and they'll do that as well, probably leveraging privileged accounts. After they've got some data, they'll then release some ransomware. Normally encrypts quite a lot of stuff. Normally means you don't have access to things. Normally try and target the backups as well. Ransomware goes across your estate. And finally, they knock on the door and they try and extort something out of you. And they normally do it in a two-stage process, actually. So they normally say, oh, give us some money and we'll de decrypt you. And once you've got over that stage, they'll say, we'll give us some more money. Otherwise, we'll release all your information onto the dark web. And that four step process is broadly the modus operandum of most of these gangs. And, and to give you some idea about these not just being, you know, the, the image of some guy in his be bedroom programming away at this. I think there was quite a good um, example, actually, at the start of the Ukraine war. And if you're into this thing, you'll have seen it, right? But the Conti ransomware gang were a gang um, who were quite prevalent, actually, a, a, a few years ago. Uh, and when the, the Ukraine war kicked off, they actually got hacked by some other hackers who, who were obviously a bit upset about them being Russian. And they released all their chats, right? And when you looked at those chats, you suddenly realised how big this gang was. And, you know, I, I don't expect people read the chats, but the chats were quite interesting if you're into that kind of stuff, right? And they're, they're a group of about 80 people. They're, they're, not, they're not trivial. You know, they're, they're running a business that's a third of a billion dollars a year. They had an HR director who was coordinating the recruitment of people. They were coordinating testers. They were coordinating coders. You know, they had different groups. They had an organization structure that they were running like a business and in order to get as much money as possible. 
So I guess it's just useful to think about actually that four-step process, actually the size of what it means to, to, to as an industry, albeit an illegal industry, and, and then it puts it into some context of what's happening across across organisations. So, so to Northumbria, and this is, well, it's not me, but it could be me, right? So August bank holiday 2020, and they're not stupid ransomware gangs, right? They know August bank holiday is a pretty good time to go and hit us because they know everyone's likely to be on holiday. And, and sure enough, August bank holiday, university, everyone was on holiday. Now, they'd been in for a bit with us, so they'd kind of probably got through the front door around about early August. And they'd probably gone it via a phishing email, actually. Probably one person clicked on a link, took them to a website. Website looked broadly like a North Umbria website. Asked them to their username and password. They typed it in completely unknowingly. That probably then routed them back to the proper North Umbria website where they typed their username and password in for a second time, didn't think anything of it, on they went on their daily business. Meanwhile, ransomware gangs now got a username and password. And what they did is they got that through the front door and then via some pretty standard tools, escalated privileges. So pretty quickly escalated some privileges and then moved laterally across the environment. And they moved laterally across the environment in a surprisingly short time. And one of the interesting things is when you unpick all this is how quickly some of these things happen and how quickly they move. So within about two or three nights, there's evidence of them moving across our environment, basically to get to Active Directory. Like every organization, Active Directory sits at the heart of what you do, holds all your usernames, all your password, all your assets. That's where they're going for, right? And so that lateral movement across your, your environment happens scarily quickly. And there are many tools on the market. And actually, we can see some of the tools they've used. You could go onto Google today. You could probably download those tools. You probably wouldn't even need to go onto the dark web to be able to do it. And if you know what you're doing, know how to use the tools, over you go. Once you get to Active Directory, again, dead easy. Extract all the usernames and passwords. Boom, that leaves your organization before you know it. Once that's gotten their command and control center, they've now got you, right? So now, they're, now they've got all your usernames and passwords, know what your admin is. And basically what they do then is they sit there and monitor, and they did that at Northumbria. So they sat there for a few days and worked out what your estate looks like. Now, the worrying thing for me as a CIO is probably they did a better job than my network manager. And probably at the end of all that, they had a beautiful picture of what my network looked like, where my servers were, where my storage was, and probably had a better CMDB than I do. And, and sometimes I feel like I should write to them and ask them for it. But nevertheless, they, they build that picture up. And, and, and you think, mm, that's, that's, that's pretty clever, right? They use some really decent tools and they know exactly what your landscape looks like. And the reason they do that is to work out where's your core data. Where's the things that really matter to you? Because well, actually what they're interested in at that first stage, if you remember on the blocks I showed you, is extracting data. Being a university, you know, it's pretty easy to work out what our core data is. It's, it's, it's around people, right? We're a people industry. So they targeted things like your student record system, your staff system for your HR and finance. And, that, and that's the data that kind of matters to you. And they managed to extract that some of that data um, and you can see, actually, they don't do it in a one because they know that might show up. There's suddenly a large amount of data leaving your organization. It's done slowly, slowly over a number of nights and, and drip feeds out of your organization. So that happened over the majority of August. Unknown. Most of the logins were in the middle of the night, not during the working day. Most of the logins disguised, bouncing around VPNs around the world. Pretty hard to identify, actually, to be honest. As a university, that's even harder for us because even when we put some controls around, and I can remember um, some early conversations that I had with, with, with law enforcement, actually, that, that said, oh, can you tell me where people are logging in from? Well, we were in the middle of COVID, right? We're university. We had people logging in from Russia, from Iran, from Iraq, from America, from South America. We had all over the world and, and they were all genuine. They were just staff and students back at home during COVID. So at a university level, trying to track where those logins are coming from, it is difficult and where data is flowing out to, it, it, it's difficult. Nevertheless, that, that, that's what happened. And then on the night of the uh, Thursday, going into the Friday before the bank holiday weekend, um, that's when things really started to happen. So in some ways, I'm quite fortunate because I, I run a service at Northumbria where I take the service desk for about 48 universities. And so I take over the service desk at about five o'clock at night and we answer the telephones for all them through the night and then we hand it back in the morning. And so because I, I do that, I, I run a, a 24 hour service. And so, you know, at about two, three o'clock in the night, 
some of my guys started to notice that they had some problems. The security team said, we've got some problems with the CCTV. And the lights started flashing on some of the monitoring. And then the lights started flashing more and more and more. And, and, and at that stage, actually, what, what really happens is, is, is no one digs out the business continuity plan of, of what's happening. What actually happens is a bit of blind panic. And when I look back now, I kind of understand it. Because it's so new and this hasn't happened to people in the past, actually the panic sets in. And so you, you get messages of this system's down. No, this system's not down. This system's down. No, this one's now come up again. And throughout the whole of that early doors in the early morning, it was very, very confusing. And I think the, the, the panic and, and, and the fact that people didn't actually know what was happening until really the gravity started hitting in is a real hard problem in those early days of a major incident, of a, such a serious major incident. So over the course of the morning, we, we obviously noted most of the core systems started going down. By three o'clock in the afternoon, I had over a thousand virtual servers on my estate. I had probably 9,000 desktops across Newcastle City ca campus, across the Coach Lane campus, which is just to north of the city, and across my London campus. Every single one that was attached to the network, physically attached to the network, had then been impacted. And I mean impacted, even the computers that were turned off, they managed to send magic packets wake the computers up and, and the computers were then impacted. So the whole of my estate, my Windows estate, had been impacted, irrespective of Windows operating system. And that happened over the course of probably between three in the morning and three in the afternoon. So a 12 hour period. So, so it is incredibly quick and incredibly quickly process. And whilst we made the decision very early doors at about lunchtime to start turning things off, actually we couldn't keep, keep pace with it. And we turned the majority of systems off by, by, by which time it, 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 it was too late. And so the algorithms they write to spread around your network, having spent that time early doors to work out what your network looks like, are incredibly efficient. And if you looked at it as a process, you'd think, ah, that, that, that's pretty good. If only we could roll out patching that quickly across our network, that, that, that'd be fantastic. The speed and the speed is quite scary. And literally, the head in the hands there is probably what it looked like at about four o'clock in the afternoon on the Friday. That actually, I looked out across my estate, and by that time, I realised what had happened: that every single Windows server had been impacted, and every single desktop had been impacted. And if it had not been for COVID, every single laptop would have been impacted. But because I had people at home, I was kind of saved a little bit by that. And so therein started the problem. Therein started the recovery. And, and it was a long recovery and it was really, really difficult because actually trying to explain it to stakeholders is, is your biggest problem to start off with. And I think, you know, if I had a vice chancellor there who was a, an expert in music. He wasn't a technical person at all. He was, he was a professor of, of music. And so I had a governing board as well who, who weren't necessarily very technical. Um, and so, so the first problem is actually how do you actually communicate to people what's going on with when we were here? at a level they're all going to understand and so i did it with actually three questions and started to think about actually this will anchor back to what they under, what they understand and there were three difficult questions right because i didn't know the answers to them on day one the first question was was can we recover well that, that was pretty difficult at the stage because i didn't have anything so i was like looking across you know just a, a burned field of crops there, there was nothing there was nothing there so I had no idea whether it had gone to the backups. I had no idea what we could recover, what we couldn't recover. And I'll be honest on this conversation here, I had a conversation with the vice chancellor very early doors that kind of went, I don't know if we've got a going concern here. And we're a quarter of a billion pound business at Northumbria. So that, that, that's a big conversation to have. The, the next big question, I guess, is, is what data do they have? You know, we were very conscious about we hold a lot of sensitive data at the university, as I'm sure all you do as, as organisations. So we, we have information about our counselling and mental health conversations we might have with students, you know, and, that, and that's over and above the, the standard sort of personal information you may have on, you know, bank details for paying people and addresses and et cetera, et cetera. But some, some, some real sensitive data as well around, around some of the cases that you might manage as, as part of um, managing student welfare. So with that, what data question they have was also a big question. And then the thing that really worried me, and I guess really kept me up awake at night, was are they still there? 
and I'd heard some real horror stories early doors about this and um you know probably did some reading early doors that I probably shouldn't have done because that doesn't help you <laughs> your mental stability and all of this but there were calls there about actually people recovering so quickly and they stood thing stood all their services back up very quickly only to find that the bad actors were still there in the corner and then they hit them again for a second time and of course the demoralization on your teams and on the business is huge so that question of are they still there played really really heavily on me but i anchored back to these three questions at the start of, of, of the recovery and we, and we um and we use these to try and describe where we were in the incident and, and obviously as, as things unfolded we were able to answer these questions or sub items of these questions as we went through but actually when you were in that major incident thinking about how you explain where you are to non-technical people when it's such a magnitude of, it, of an issue was really really important so, so so you know when i reflected on this 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 really helped me actually to, to be able to, to be able to talk in those sort of terms not a major incident you know that you might have a, a system x is down but something of this type of gravity and scale now there were below all that there were a number of other things that of course you know and some of which we've spoken about today that we really had to start thinking about. The first one then was around business continuity. You know, we've heard some, some, some talks this morning about business continuity. But actually, when this happened, this was a real business continuity situation where there was te no technology. O on day one, we had we had no IT. So we weren't sure if obviously our Microsoft environment had been impacted. And we weren't sure actually if our email had been compromised. And therefore. We said to everyone on day one, don't use the email, don't use the Microsoft stack. In fact, you can't use any IT because I've turned the rest of it off. And actually, that really, really highlighted early doors about, hmm, so how is your business continuity? I had an old conversation very, very early doors with one department in the university that kind of went on the lines of, don't worry, Simon, I've got business continuity. And I was like, yeah, great, fantastic. What, 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 what are you going to do then? Oh, well, when you, when you stand up Excel, we're going to do everything in Excel instead of doing it in the normal workflow process. Uh, yeah, you've not really got the no IT part in all of this. And I, and I think that's really dangerous these days because people are so used to using IT, they're so used to technology that the thought of having none of it was quite scary to a lot of people. And this was literally back to pen and papers in places for the first initial, the initial times. The second question that, you know, if you get hit with a big cyber attack is, is the do we pay one? maybe more because we're a university there's a real ethical conversation about that you know we, we have we have a number of students here the students pay their fees we're semi-charity you know there's a real ethical discussion about do you pay and if you do want to pay then that's a whole host of a uh, uh, of drama that you open up and there are special teams that are involved in negotiations and all sorts that you need to get involved in but it's a big question that you need to ask um, and, and, and and you know have you really thought how mature your processes are around that because that can suck a lot of um, time and effort into even that, even answering that question. We were lucky because I guess in some respects in 2020 that, that we had some cyber assurance. Cyber assurance these days is almost impossible to get unless you want to play an absolute for, fortune for it. Now, when I look back now, this had some advantages and some not so advantages. The insurance company actually were very, very good. So they signed some people to us very, very early, early doors. And one of them being some um, cyber investigators, some people that helped us with the investigation side of things, not necessarily the recovery, the investigation. Um, but, but that was very useful. But actually, do you have insurance? Do you not have insurance? It's a big question for um, organisations these days um, and, and, and the value of that insurance. We heard earlier doors about communications as well. And, and this was this is a huge part for, for me, you know, it's very, very difficult in, in this type of example of a cyber incident of what you can and cannot tell people. And so we had to really think about what do you tell your staff? What do you tell your students? What do you tell the outside world? Because you don't really want to put too much on your on your corporate website once you stand your corporate website up, because you don't because you know that the bad actors are probably listening to what you're saying and what and watching what you're saying. So you've got to really think about in this type of incident what that communications is. Having those processes to get going quickly is so important because you'd be surprised how quickly communications need to be stood up, how quickly you need to keep people informed and to what level you need to keep them informed. Again, we've heard about regulators. The university, we had a lot of regulators. 
we played um I, I think the right thing in our incident, we kept the regulators really close when we did when we did our work. We, um, that was the ICO we kept close, but also the Office of Students and, and some of the other people that we, we spoke to. And then the last point that I've left is the people. And this is sometimes the hardest thing. And when I reflect back now, actually, the people was quite a difficult thing to work through. So we naturally all ran to sort the incident out and all ran to do some hard work. And we all worked really hard in the first week. And then everyone was really, really knackered at the end of the half first week. And then we realized it was going to be another week and another week and another week. And so that temptation to put all your best people really early doors into solving the incident when you've got something very, very big is really difficult because you need your, your team two to come out and, and, and help the people who are in team one. Also, when it goes on for so long, people just get on with their lives, right? There are birthdays, there are holidays, there are school events. And so you can't expect people to be there all the time when you've got something going on for so long. So the people management side of things, making sure that you don't get the heroes who work so many hours that they just fall over, making sure that you make, give people some sort of life behind all this is really, really difficult because it does take a toll on you. And, and the story I've told before is that um, we were in COVID and in some respects COVID helped because it meant everyone was at home. So it meant people actually could get a break when they needed to get a break. They could go and see their kids and they could work late. I think if it had happened on site, it would have been quite difficult. And it's made me think a little bit about war rooms because we would have probably stood up a war room for this. We'd have probably had everyone on site. They'd have probably all driven in in the morning. We'd have gone through stuff during the day. We'd have worked late and they would all driven home at night and we'd have done that day after day. And that toll would have been quite hard. Having COVID really helped us, I think, because actually people could get up and walk away from their computer and could go and do something with their kids. Um, and so there was an aspect about how you actually ran the major incident that was really interesting for me. And, well, and one thing that I, that I reflected on in, 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 after it, that maybe COVID helped us during this time. Nevertheless, the, the, the toll is amazing. And, and I've told the story, and not, not to make it about me, but, but I, I sat here during that incident. Uh, I lost a stone and a half. I was sat in this very seat, right? And I didn't really move much. And I lost a stone and a half from the stress of managing this. It's the people element cannot be cannot be underestimated. I anchor back at the start of the story to say it was all about people. And I still think now when you reflect back, it is all about people and people are the number one attack vector. And when you think now about how easy it was to click on a phishing email, and that's one way of getting people and we have some pretty good techniques in cross and from being able to stop phishing emails, but still they get through. But actually, it's just still people and people are the, the dangerous thing in here. And I've got some silly examples here, right? So I sent an IT technician out the other day into a room, didn't have his IT kit on, so no uniform, didn't have his IT badge. He walked around to a number of members of staff and said, I'm from IT. Can you give me a username and password? And guess what? After about half an hour, I've got a username and password, and off he went. I've had people tailgate into spaces. We're an open university. It's dead easy, right? And I've had even people walking up to people at our service desks saying, can I plug something in, please? And plugging in Raspberry Pis that have then been able to go back home and work out what's going on and work out all the keystrokes. And so even that people element is such a hard attack vector to sort out because people are just generally trusting and generally aren't in the space that someone's out to come and get them. I think the new ways of working have also been introduced in risks now. When you look back now at the cyber incident of what, of what we had and where we went from, bring your own devices all over the place now, hard to manage as an organisation. COVID has driven it through that. I think public Wi-Fi's, unsecure networks, again, the fact that people are far more mobile these days, it's made it rough, far, far harder to keep control of some things. And also sharing of devices, and this happens a lot across the university, that people share their work devices with family, now they're spending more time at home. And these new risks are now certainly, when, when we reflect back about our cyber um, incident, these are things that are now starting to really hurt us. Also, what I see a lot about, and uh, maybe some organisations will be less, less of a problem than a university, but unlicensed torrented software on personal devices continues to be a big, a, a, a big problem for us more so on the student side of things, I guess, than the staff side of things. But uh, people are still there thinking uh, free software, I can get free software and that, that comes at a cost. So looking forward now, post that incident, 
where, where have we got to as, as North Umbria? I, I guess the first thing is, is we've decided that IT sits at the heart of everything we do. That defense in a box, though, that silver bullet doesn't exist. And so we've got to have a suite of techniques and processes. We've got to have uh, layered things that both do preventative and detective techniques. And we've heard a bit, again about in the first presentation about, about those two sides of things. But you need to start thinking in, in those sort of terms. And we've certainly done that at Northumbria. And I guess the rather depressing point in all of this is the, well, we now think we're operating in a compromised environment. So we're always thinking, actually, that there's someone in the environment today and someone working in there. And what does that really mean for us for searching for threats and monitoring the environment and what might be going on in that environment? Now, the cyber incident is nothing but trying to um, get on the coattails of a, of a bad thing to make it a good thing. And I think we've certainly done that at the North Umbria. I think whilst it decays over time, Actually, if you ask most members of staff there, they'd anchor back to the cyber incident, realize how hard it was, and actually will now accept that IT security does sit at the heart of everything we do. And where things are a little bit awkward, I think they're a little bit more accepting having been through it all. Our hardest task now is to make that current and keep that current, because unfortunately time decays and people forget what it really meant. The other key thing that we've now worked out in the firm, and I think this is really good for, for MIs, is to really think what your core data assets are. What are the crown jewels that you're really, really interested in? And then actually go up from working out what your crown jewels are to actually how do you properly classify them? How do you properly put the right controls around those data assets that only the people that need to get to those assets can get to them and that the data leakage of those assets is, is managed? Because if you go back to the first slide I showed you, actually, the data exfiltration is one of the key things that these gangs want, because they want to do the two the, the two hit. They don't want to just do a, a, a data encryption across your estate. They, they want to get hold of your data. They, there's value in that data, and, and they want to get hold of it. So the more you can think about what are your crown jewels of your organization and how to protect them, the better. The key next thing, of course, is a robust backup solution. It's something that's air-gapped it, it, it is so key. You know, in some respects, we were lucky. Were we lucky? I don't know. I think we were well planned. We, 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 we knew about this before we were attacked. And so we had a, a, an air gap solution. Um, I, 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 I still remember the story now, actually, about backups, because I, I guess that's when you're in the incident, that, that, that's one of the hardest things. So when the incident happened and we're starting to recover, obviously, early doors in, in that recovery process, you need to fire up your backup solution and sort of build that bridge over to the backup solution to check that everything's okay. Now, this was the backdrop, of course, of we're all still worried, are they still there? And I can remember sitting on a call, and of course, this is in the middle, middle of COVID, so, so we're all, all, all remote. And my server and storage manager was, was on the other end, and, and he was going to first sort of build that bridge over to the backup solution to check that we were all okay. And he was online, and of course, he didn't have his camera on because he's a server and storage manager, and he was probably in a dark room somewhere. And you could hear him typing away and we were sort of saying, right, how, how are we doing? Are we all okay? And you could hear him going, yeah, yeah, all good. And I said, right, how are we doing? Yeah, yeah, all good. And he went, oh, oh, that's not good. And I can remember to this day almost being sick over my keyboard at that point and realising the backups weren't there. But what he meant to say was, I've just typed the wrong command. And, and then the next, his next line was, yep, everything's fine. But that robust backup solution is so important. If that backup solution had been compromised, then you're in a real difficult position. And so making sure that is my biggest piece of advice and the biggest thing we've learned. They can, cyber criminals can remain undetected longer than your backup retention. They can sit things in your backup sessions and they'll target it for, for, for that. So making sure that you've got that air gaps um, backup is, is so important. And then the last thing we stopped doing, well, thinking it wouldn't happen to us, right? I guess if you, I asked me in 2020, I would have said we were probably low down a target. We're a university. We're doing good in the world. We're trying to change people's lives. We're trying to do research that's going to change the world. Why on earth would you want to attack us? We'd well, want to attack us because we're a quarter of a billion pound business. It doesn't matter where that money comes from. We've got a large revenue number against us, and these gangs don't care. So thinking differently about it is, the, is our key way forward and what it really means. Reflecting back now, there's some simple things that I now do on a daily basis. No more common threats. So I like to know what's going on now. I take a keen interest in it as a CIO. I like to share best practices. I like to do talks like this. I like to answer questions, report concerns. 
you know, so we, we have an open forum now at the university and a means to answer questions. We've got resources and training on hand. And I think being a role model and all of this is, is so important. And some of those simple things really help actually spread the message of because I certainly would not want this to happen to anyone else. I think uh, one institution going through it is more than enough.